today here on campus. For those of you watching this video as online students, we did enrichment problems on thermodynamics, specifically looking at Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant. So if you're an online student, you can uh, go to the course website and download this file. You can also just pause the recording and try this for yourself and then hit record and hit um, resume when you're ready to see the answers. It's only two problems. Here's problem one and there's problem two. So this is what we did here on campus today and now we're going to go over them. So let's talk about the answers. All right, so this is true statement. There are certain bacteria that do produce methane gas, um, and you can collect methane when you've got bacteria. And so we've got this reaction going on. We've got our uh, acetic acid. It's being metabolized by our bacteria as carbon dioxide gas and methane gas. We want to know what's the value of the equilibrium constant. So again, you got to have what in order to do this? You got to have some sort of reference page. Either open your textbook to the back, find one on the internet, download the one that I gave you. Um, there are a lot of sources for this. Your answers may vary ever so slightly based on the number of sig figs on your reference page, but within rounding, you should have the same answers I got. So we want an okay, right? That's the equilibrium constant. Is there something we have to calculate first? We have to calculate delta G first, right? Because we can't, we don't have the information to do an ice table. So we have to go a long way about it. We have to calculate delta G first. What's the formula for delta G? Delta H minus T. All right, my delta H minus T delta S. So we gotta calculate Gibbs free energy first. So I got, well, let me calculate delta H, I should say. For delta H, I got negative 74.87 plus negative 393.5 minus negative 486, which I got 17.63 kilojoules. For delta S, I got 186.1 plus 213.7 minus 86.6. So that came out to be 313.2 joules, right? Those come out in different units, so you'll obviously need to convert them to the same unit before plugging into your delta G expression. So for delta G, I got delta H minus T delta S. So I went ahead and converted kilojoules to joules because I'm going to need my answer to be in joules for my next part. So that means 1,000, excuse me, 17,630 minus 38 degrees Celsius, convert that to Kelvin, 311 Kelvin times 313.2. I got negative 79,800 joules. Do we agree for delta G within rounding? That's delta G. Why do I want delta G to be in joules? Because R is in joules, right? So to calculate K, what's the relationship there? Delta G equals what? Negative RT times the natural log of K. Good, right? And R is in joules. So that means negative 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole, right? And my temperature is still 311. And what do I put in for delta G? My value I just got, right? Negative 79,800 times the natural log of K. So we do a little bit of rearranging. Negative 79,800 is equal to negative 2585.7 times the natural log of K. So natural log of K is equal to 30.86. Therefore, K is equal to E to the 30.86, which I got as 
2.5 times 10 to the 13th. All right, now I do have a little bit of a self-check built in. If I have a large negative delta G, should K be a big number? They should be, right? Because this is saying product favored. This is also saying product favored. So do we agree on the numerical portion of this? Within rounding again, depending on how many decimal places you carry here. That's the value of the equilibrium constant, 2.5 times 10 to the 13th. Is that product favored? Yes, very. And then, is this corresponding to spontaneous? Yes, it is, right? Of course, this is being carried out by bacteria, so bacteria could manipulate it to make it unspontaneous if uh, that was something that was part of the bacteria's biomechanism. Do we agree on A? How we got A? All right, equilibrium constant calculation. Extremely product favored. Now let's look at B. So B is where we get into some review. So B asks us, let's pretend that bacteria in a certain 20 liter section of the landfill collectively produce an acetic acid solution with a concentration of 2.89 moles per liter. What mass of methane will be released when the bacteria metabolize the acetic acid? So if we're gonna do this problem, what will we have to do? <clears throat> what do we have to do? There's only one way to go about this. To get the mass of the methane, we need to know what? The concentration of that methane, right? And how are we gonna get concentration if we know equilibrium constant? There's only one answer, what is it? Ice table, right. So we go back to our review of equilibrium, right? So CH3, CO2H, and Q is in equilibrium with the CO2 gas and CH4 gas. And we just solved for K in the previous problem and got 2.5, times 10 to the 13th. Because K is a large number greater than one, can I use the 5% approximation in this ice table? No way, can't do it, right? Let's see, by the way. So let's make our ice table. All right, so the problem tells us that it's 2.89 molar, which means this is initially zero, this is initially zero, and so this is going to go down by X, 2.89 minus x. This is going to go up by x. So how do I solve for x? Think back to equilibrium. What's my equilibrium expression going to be? K equals concentration of CO2 times the concentration of methane divided by the concentration of CH3, CO2H, all right? And I know the value of K, 2.5 times 10 to the 13th is equal to X squared over 2.89 minus X, all right? Cannot use the 5% approximation because K is very much so greater than one. So when I do a little bit of rearranging here, I get 7.23 times 10 to the 13th minus 2.5 times 10 to the 13th x equals x squared. Rearrange that to something you're a little more familiar with. x squared plus 2.5 times 10 to the 13th x minus 7.23 times 10 to the 13th equals zero. 
So what is this going to require me to do? What's the only way I can solve this? Got to do the quadratic equation, right? So I get x equals negative 2.5 times 10 to the 13th, which is nonsense. Can't have a negative concentration. And x equals 2.89. Well, does it make sense that this value is going to go all the way down to zero? Would you expect that this would go down to very to zero if not very, very close? When you've got this much of a product favored equilibrium? Yeah, that's a reasonable answer. For this to go all the way down to zero, that's reasonable, right? Because we are extremely product favored. K is 10 to the 13th. So yeah, that's a reasonable value for x. So that's the value that we plug back in. All right, so this equals zero. This is 2.89, this is 2.89. Now that's the concentration, but the problem asks what mass? So how do I get the mass? Well, I know the volume here, right? That's the molarity, 2.89 moles per liter, and the volume is 20 liters. So that gives me a molarity. Now let's go ahead, I mean that gives me number of moles. Let's go ahead and convert that to grams. All right, this is methane, so it has a molar mass of 16 grams per mole. So that gives me my mass in grams. And I got, when I round my final answer to three significant figures, I got 927 grams, right? Three sig figs, three, three, yes, three. 927 grams are released. Do we see how we got this problem's answer? Reviewing some equilibrium while we're at it. Because hey, if we're gonna talk about the equilibrium constant, might as well go back and review I states. Questions on this one? Feeling okay on this one? All right, let's look at number two which I've technically called this number two by how I hit enter a bunch of times. Okay, now let's look at number two. You are studying the dissociation of silver 1 bromide at 23 degrees Celsius. All right, so first thing we got to do is ask ourselves what on earth is dissociation and what on earth is the formula for silver 1 bromide? What's dissociation? What does that mean? When something dissociates, what does it do? Breaks into its ions, right? breaks into its ions. So if we've got a GBr solid and it dissociates, what is it dissociating into? A G plus and Br minus, right? Again, review. Reviewing a lot of stuff here. I want to know what's the change in Gibbs free energy here. So this is calculated how? Delta G is equal to what? Delta H minus T delta S, right? So I'm using my lovely reference page here to get all my values. So let's get delta H first. I got 105.6 plus negative 121.5 minus negative 100.4. So that gave me 84.5 kilojoules. For delta S, I got 72.68 plus 82.64 minus 107.1, which gave me 
0.22 joules. Do we agree within rounding? And so for delta G, delta H minus T delta S. So I got, let's see, plugging in my values, 84. Oh, I went ahead and converted that to joules since I'll be doing it later. Right, I went ahead and converted that to joules because later on I'll be dealing with joules. So 84,500 minus 296, because that's my temperature in Kelvin, times 48.22. So that gave me 70,227 joules. Did you get something similar within rounding? What's the change in Gibbs free energy? Based on that delta G, I think that is even the question answered or part of the question part B. Oops. Yeah, that's part of part B. Based on this information, will silver one bromide spontaneously dissolve in water at this temperature? What's the answer? If delta G is positive 70 kilojoules, approximately, is this going to occur spontaneously at this temperature? No, right, this is non-spontaneous. So what would you observe at 23 degrees Celsius? If you take a clump of the AGBR and you dump it in there, it's non spontaneous at 23 degrees Celsius. So, what's it going to look like? Is it going to go away or is it just going to sit there? It's just going to sit there. It's right? just going to sink to the bottom of your beaker. It's going to sit there. So, part B asks if it's not spontaneous, what temperature must you be at in order for it to dissolve spontaneously? And just a reminder, someone refresh my memory. What does spontaneous mean? Without any help, right? Not any outside intervention. So because this is all temperature dependent, what temperature should I be at for this solid to dissolve spontaneously? That's what this is asking. So how do you solve this problem? Right, so we're gonna solve the delta G equation with delta G as zero, right? Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. We're going to say that's zero. Where do we get delta H and delta S? We just got them, right? We just calculated that. So let's see, that was the 84,500 minus T and then 48.2. So Negative 84,500 is equal to negative 48.22 T. So T, I got 1,752 Kelvin. That's pretty hot. It's really hot, right? But let's think back to what we're trying to get to happen here, right? This is something that's got a delta G on its own at pretty close to room temperature of uh, 70 kilojoules. So you're gonna have to really crank up the temperature for this to dissociate spontaneously. Do we agree on how we got B? And that's, that's hot, that's hot. All right, in C, part C, What is the KSP? Oops. What is the KSP at this temperature? So, does the fact that it's called SP, does that make a difference in our calculations? That just refers to the fact that it's dissolving, right? That just refers that <coughs> to the fact that it's in equilibrium. 
between the ions and the solid, right? So don't let that freak you out. Calculating K is calculating K. So whether or not you call it KSP or K just depends on if you're talking about ions or if you're not. So this is not anything that we should freak out about. What's the equation for delta, I mean for K? What do we need to do to calculate K? We use delta G, all right, which we just calculated. All right, negative RT times the natural log of K. If you want to call it KASP, right, that doesn't matter because that just refers to the fact that it's a dissociation. So we calculated delta G already. So that needs to be in joules, right? 70,227, let's see if I'm a negative 8.314 times 296 times the natural log of K. So 70 to 27 is equal to negative 2460.9 times the natural log of K. So I got natural log of K is equal to negative 28.5. So K must be e to the negative 28.5, which I got 4.04 .04 times 10 to the negative 13. Is that a reasonable K given the delta G? Yeah, it is. Just out of curiosity, Let's look up what the equilibrium constant is for this at uh, room temperature. Let's just see what it is. K B K A. Just regular old K. K S P. Let's see. EGBR, it's 5.4 times 10 to the negative 13th at 25 degrees Celsius. So it's 4.04 .04 times 10 to the negative 13th at 23. That's reasonable. All right. Do we agree on how to do this one using KSP? Solving for KSP, I should say. All right. Last part of the problem asks us. One more thing, which is again a nice review. You place a scoop of solid silver one bromide in water at 23 degrees Celsius. What would you expect the molar concentration of the bromide ion to be at this temperature? So how do you solve a problem like this? What are we asking you to solve? You're calculating what? Can you do this without an ice table? I mean, if you can do it in your head, that's great. But it would probably help you if you made an ice table. All right, so let's do that. AGBR is in equilibrium with AG plus, plus BR minus. And we're at 23 degrees Celsius, so we want to use the KSP at that temperature, which we just found to be 4.04 .04 times 10 to the negative 13. All right, so we got to make a nice table. Who cares? It's a solid. Initially zero. Initially zero. Plus x. Plus x. One to one coefficients here, so we don't have to deal with any coefficients flowing through my ice table. All right, so. KSP is equal to concentration of AG plus times BR minus. So 4.04 .04 times 10 to the negative 13th is equal to X squared. So X is equal to the square root of that, which I got 6.36 times 10 to the negative seventh, which we plug in here. And here, since we don't have any coefficients to deal with, 
What would you expect the concentration of bromide to be? Right. It would just be 6.36 times 10 to the negative seventh. And what would my units be? Moles per liter, right. So review of KSP. How do we feel about this one? All right, so that's where we're going to end. If you have additional questions, you're free to stick around. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow.